Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Eva Tomczak. Mm, I'm very happy to be here, to be here with you. And uh, I'm very excited about uh, welcoming you all uh, at the second edition of this conference uh, titled Designing Solutions for Education. Uh, it's for teachers, it's for lecturers, it's for superintendents. And this year we received the patronage of the Ministry of Education and we are really, really proud of it. And our goal for this event uh, is proving that uh, deliberate designing and implementing sustainable solutions, uh, well thought solutions in the educational system is possible. And since we have been living in very, very interesting times in 2020, there was no other option for the, for the theme of this event than struggling with change. Um, but before we start with the keynote speech of exceptional guest, let me mention two issues. First of all, I would love to thank all uh, our supporting partners uh, that helped us um, promote the event and make, the, make it accessible for everyone interested. And the second issue is about certificates. If you are watching live and you would like to receive certificate of attendance, uh, you will get the opportunity to order a digital version at the end of the webinar. So stay with us. And I can promise you that staying with us will be very, very inspiring because of our special guest. Let me introduce, officially introduce, Ewan McIntosh, uh, the founder of consulting firm Notosh. And Ewan lives in Scotland, but he runs projects all over the world and works uh, with uh, people in schools, uh, universities and companies. And today he will talk about designing a transition to something new in a more sustainable and less exhausting way. So Yuan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and good morning everyone. So um, I'm glad we're recording this. I hope that you can go back to the video, maybe bring it to your team if your team's not been able to join you today, uh, use it for a professional learning moment. Mm -hmm. um, but what I want to try and do is share as many useful, valuable things in a short period of time so that you can go and um, uh, continue learning with your team. Now, uh, a couple of little house rules. Uh, one is microphones off um, during this part. Uh, we're going to record the session, so we want to avoid any um, kind of uh, background noises. Uh, so make sure your microphone is muted. But if your um, video is on, it's much nicer for me because I, I can see your smiling faces and have someone to talk to. So um, I think I can uh, uh, mute you all um, automatically like that. So and hopefully, um, unless you switch on your microphone, we'll be OK. Uh, second rule, if you like, is that um, we've got two options. We've got some choices about how we want to run the second half of our hour together. Uh, yes, I'm going to share a keynote, uh, but I'm also going to ask for your for some discussion and dialogue. And we've got um, uh, the group is just the right size really for both of these things. We could do a question and answer. If you want to do that, all I would ask is put your uh, questions in the chat then Ava can take a look at those questions and we can go quite quickly that way. And when it comes to the questions, um, I'll ask you to switch your microphone on and we can have a dialogue. Um, the second th uh, thing we can do is a breakout to have a discussion if you want. So we'll see how you go. If you ask lots of questions in the chat, then we can have a, a Q and A. So um, I'm going to share the screen sometimes and other times it's nice, I think, to, to be able to see faces of people. Um, but uh, this is where I am in the city of Edinburgh in Scotland. And um, we've been preparing really for uh, a decade for this uh, kind of moment. For a decade, we wanted to do 
more work online, take fewer aeroplanes to places to do our work, but nobody wanted to do that because it's nicer, of course, to meet people face to face. Um, but now um, people have had to, they've been forced to change the way they think about that. And our mission as a company at Notosh is to think differently and change the way we all choose to work. Most people don't think they have a choice in how they work, that someone else's decision. What we help teams realize is that you can change everything. Um, you can change the way that you choose to work, but how you go about that is the most interesting thing. So um, we've got some online courses which we're going to be uh, bringing people through and they launch from September. So if you're interested, you can go to that short link, uh, Notosh course, and you can sign up for more. Um, they, they will help bring your team through, um, but of course you can also open source this, you can do it yourself. Don't hesitate to get in touch if you don't understand the Scottish accent. I don't know if you've heard the joke before um, about the the mafia, you know, the Italian mafia make you an offer you can't refuse. Uh, the Scottish mafia make you an offer you can't understand. So if you don't understand everything, then please do not be shy to drop an email and say, Ewan, I loved it, but what was that one point you were trying to make? I wanted to understand more. Uh, please feel free to do that. Now, Thank you, first of all, for coming today too. Um, the definition for me of a leader is someone who shows up and someone who uh, decides that they're going to create something. And the, uh, there, are, there are two quotes really. <laughs> this first one is not from someone I admire particularly, uh, but I think the quote is important because the quote is from Margaret Thatcher. And of course, Margaret Thatcher, when I was a child, was the symbol of everything that we didn't want um, in our part of, of the country. But um, she had this funny quote, I think, that being a leader is like being a lady. If you have to remind people you are, you aren't. And so um, leading in this difficult time, leading in a time of transition is not about your job title. It's not about saying, um, well, I'm the chief executive or I'm the manager or I'm this uh, person with a job title. It's actually about turning up. It's about seeing the challenge, but also seeing the opportunity. And it's about inspiring someone else. All you need is one other person to make a team. It's inspiring one other person to join you on the journey of creating something different. Now, transition design is not a new thing. You've heard of design thinking purposefully setting aside time, tools, skills to uh, find problems, shape problems, come up with ideas to solve them. Transition design is about acknowledging we live in a time of transition. Nothing that we build today is going to be perfect X months or years from now. So the old way of doing things, particularly in education, was get it right, then launch. Um, so let's line up all the ducks, let get, let's get everything ready, let's write the whole curriculum, let's build the perfect school environment and then life will be good. And as a classroom teacher, I was a French and German teacher in school, but um, as, a, as a teacher, your classroom was never perfect. You were always waiting for uh, the, the, the thing to get fixed or waiting for the space or saying, if only I could have this. Transition design is saying, well, it's never going to be perfect and my ideas will never be perfect. The most important thing is to launch. It's to do the thing that needs done. And at this moment in time, that couldn't be more important. At this moment in time, we've got so many things changing around us that you've got two options. One is sit at home and watch Netflix and put your head uh, deep into the cushion. And the second is try to make small changes. Try and have small wins that when you add them all together, actually make a big difference for our young people. Or if you work for, a, for an organization, a business, it works for your customers. Or if you work for government, it makes a difference for your citizens. But the only question you've got to ask really is, where are the people that I am serving? Where is their biggest challenge? And what is the smallest thing I can do to 
resolve that challenge for them. Now, I think there are four or five things that all of us can do starting this week and next. And doing these things helps to start creating the kinds of positive change. And it's important to create positive change because it's not possible to go back to what we had before. In English, we, we, we talk about going back to school. Really, we're going forward to school, whatever school is now. We're going forward. It's very unlikely that we can go back. And so if you've, um, hopefully, you've had that moment of realization. If not, I'm sorry to be the bringer of bad news, but we're not going to go back. And we're seeing that in Scottish schools, which have already been open now for 10 days. We're seeing it in the Scottish examination system, which uh, has really this year become irrelevant. Uh, the same is true in England, if you're looking at the headlines there. So the, these changes have happened this year. I think we would be mad to think that there won't be changes next year. Even the International Baccalaureate has changed its diploma programme this year to do less content, something that teachers have been asking for for years. But they've finally done it because the crisis around us has pushed it. And so when we look at the silver linings that are there, we can start to build really positive ideas that create the kind of education system or the kind of public services that we've always wanted. So let me share some of these strategies that can be uh, useful when you're trying to uh, create change. Now the very first one, maybe not surprising uh, given I'm a teacher, many of you are educators too, is learn. You've got to learn, but learning is not about sitting at home uh, reading books or articles on Medium. For me, learning means listening. And a lot of um, organisations are very poor at listening to what people are saying and doing. Not because they're bad people, but because they don't think about it. Otto Sharma, the psychologist, um, asks this question, how, how well do you think um, you, you listen? And uh, the answer to that, of course, is, uh, you know, some people say, well, I listen very well. Other people say, um, I don't listen well at all. Um, so that's the kind of almost childlike answer to that question. The correct answer to that question is, well, there are different types of listening. And organizationally, you might say there are five types of listening. So, um, the first type of listening is cosmetic listening. It's not really listening at all. So cosmetic listening is when you're uh, really, you have your plan, you have your idea, and you're going to make it happen, whatever happens. Not listening at all to what people say. But let's rewind a little. Before you have an idea of the change you need to create, is it possible for you to go and listen to people? And by listening, I, I mean you let them download. It's like when your friend calls you and says, I need to talk. Well, and they, they really do need to talk, but they don't need you to talk. They, need, they just need a pair of ears, someone to listen. They don't want your advice. They don't want your ideas. They just want to go, wow, that's downloading. And it's incredibly important. And it doesn't take long. When we do downloading, we'll often interview someone. So we might ask one or just two questions in the space of 10 minutes and they talk. And when they finish talking, we leave a big silence. And in that silence, people don't like silence, they fill it. And when they fill it, they start telling the truth. And, and that's the interesting stuff. So when you ask people, um, the same is true when you ask people, how are you doing? In, uh, uh, in the UK, there's a fantastic campaign at the moment around mental health awareness for men in particular. And it's called the Ask Twice campaign. If you ask a man generally, how are you doing? The answer is very quick. Oh, fine. But if you ask twice, then people start to say, well, actually, no, it's, I had a really tough week last week. And da, 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 da. And we start to get more details. So ask twice, you know, let, the, let people fill the silence and really let them download. Don't interrupt. Interrupting is really conversation. And conversation is when you listen in order to respond. It's when you're listening for a key word that you were expecting so that you can then make your contribution, your clever point. Now, if you're really listening for investigation, to understand, to immerse yourself in how people are feeling about the challenges in front of them, conversation is not useful. 
if you start to realize that you're falling into conversation, I don't know, bite your lip or um, uh, pinch your hand, but try not to because it stops people being able to make their contribution. An empathizer is someone who asks a particular type of question in those silences. And they might ask a good empathizing question is, what makes you think that? Or where did that idea come from? Or um, what, make, what makes you feel that way? To try and understand a little bit more the rationale, the feelings that people have behind them. And then the final type of listening is that emergent collaboration. When you've listened and you start to see how what that person is telling you connects with what person A, B and C over here told you earlier on. And so you've got these different types of listening that allow you to uh, tap in to your interviews, to your roundtables, your focus groups. And you could use these with teams when you start back uh, at work or when you, when you go back to your, your own team. You could put a big poster like this on the wall and say, I just want to download for 10 minutes. And John or you know, Yannick, it's, it's you. You're going, to, you're going to download. Everyone else, shush. We're gonna, you're going to write, you can take notes, but no one interrupt. No one say, mm, just be quiet and listen and let someone download. So there you go. Now, when I asked these questions, I had um, a group of uh, about 300 uh, teachers from three schools in Brazil, a family of schools. And this was really when uh, Brazil was beginning to realize the scale of the challenge ahead as a country. Now, on the left hand side, we asked them with their online and blended learning, what new habits were beginning to take place? What new practices were those teachers beginning to develop? And we use um, an online tool like um, Mural or Miro. Um, these are like whiteboarding tools you can use with a team online. And we asked them to plot what worked well, what needed to change, unanswered questions or new ideas that they wanted to try. And um, we gave them maybe 10 to 15 minutes to do that and talk them over, discuss them with friends. And then the second thing that we did is we said, OK, now drag over the things that you talked about, those new habits, and tell me which ones you feel have the highest impact or meet the needs of your students the most and which ones um, don't. <laughs> and then the other question was, how much does it cost? So what we're looking for are things on the top right of the page. And so when you look at what they created, from what habits and new practices are finding their place and then moving over here, is that everything on the right hand side has high impact and costs nothing. And all of that was um, learning, teaching and ideas. But everything on the left hand side, which had high impact, but cost a lot of money was technology, almost exclusively. And so we realized we had two problems. The first problem, is that the teachers did not have enough opportunity still to share simple ideas they were using in the classroom. So they needed time together. That was it. That was the most revolutionary thing we could offer to improve the quality of learner experience was give teachers planned time together to share new strategies on, in the classroom. And of course, what leadership often do is they concentrate on the things that cost a lot of money. So they concentrate naturally on things like technology and platforms. But actually that, taught, that takes so long because you've got to make purchasing decisions, you've got to procure, you've got to ship it, you've got to get it in people's hands. And so when you have a short term goal, the easiest thing to do is the cheapest. But they've also managed to develop a plan for the longer term based on what people had identified on the left. So this is how you can listen when you have hundreds or thousands of people in your community. This took 45 minutes to do a really quick online workshop with hundreds of people, and we were able to find out what those people thought. If you're a smaller group, and if you're able to meet face-to-face, -face, then you can do this. You can create a project nest. This is the physical version of the digital thing you just saw. And that project nest, or a war room, it depends if you, if you work with very young children, we call it a project nest because war room doesn't really sound appropriate. Um, but uh, project nests are the idea that everyone brings like a cuckoo, 
uh, they bring all the little things that they find back to the nest and they're able to then analyze and synthesize what they found. So how do you fill a project nest, whether it's a physical one or a digital one? There are lots of different activities you can do. The first thing is when you have a faculty professional learning event or if you have a team professional learning event, if you're in a school and you're beginning next week back at school, maybe you have a couple of days where your staff are going to learn. The last thing I would do with that time, the last thing is try to teach them something new or use it to transmit information because there's too much information to transmit at the moment. That kind of transmitting information, put it in a document and let them read it. What I would use faculty professional learning for is listening. So use these opportunities to ask people, what do you need and what's working well for you? That's the first step to listening to your staff or your team. Um, we work a lot with international schools. So um, a lot of the staff will speak English and then you have local language staff. If you work in a, in a Polish organization, then you may have um, lots of Polish staff, but you may also have staff for whom Polish is a second or third language. And so having a local language event, if you like, a mother tongue opportunity for people to share their challenges. You know, maybe they are stuck away from family uh, in, in another country and they've not been able to see each other uh, for months. That's important to know. Is there something you can do to bring that sense of family to local staff who are maybe uh, feeling very isolated uh, in Poland at the moment? So think about, about those people who are not the persona of your, you know, your normal person. There's no such thing as normal people. So find out the groups that need that opportunity to speak in different ways. Parents, it might be difficult to run a parent breakfast if you're having to socially distance, but you can run an online parent breakfast. They bring their own food and their own coffee, but you give them an opportunity um, over Zoom breakout rooms, for example, to talk about what's important for them. It's a really stressful time for parents. I'm doing this with two children still at home um, and with there's hoovering and cleaning going on behind me and I hope it's not getting in the way of, of trying to communicate with you guys but what are the pressures that your parents have been seeing and is there anything that we can do uh, as an institution to help there? Parent breakfasts are lovely because they're social. The food and the drink is the social object and it makes talking about difficult things easier. What about your local business community? If you work in a, an education group, then asking your local business community to rally around, let's talk about how business is changing in light of the challenges they're facing at the moment. And what do businesses need from the education community? But likewise, what do you, if you're an education group, what do you want from your local business community? Can you partner to share the load? Can you come together and collaborate to make life easier for each party? Is there an opportunity to use local businesses and their offices as um, learning environments for children who aren't able to get to school, for example? It depends on where you are today, but the, the next time that your school is unable to open, maybe children still want to have a place where they can go in safety to collaborate. And so you can start having creative ideas about does a school have to be a school building or it could be could it be somewhere else could it be a local business and if learning is changing show parents how it's changing what's a class what does it look like what does blended learning feel like what does online learning feel like although a lot of parents feel that they they got an understanding of what it was like to learn at home they didn't really they were administering it but can you offer them an experience that shows what you're trying to do so that they understand it more and they send you fewer WhatsApp messages and emails because they understand at least what you're trying to achieve. So if you work in an education organization, again, all of these ideas are vital. And use online tools where you can to uh, capture. The one advantage we've found is that using online tools allows you to capture those ideas so much better. Second thing is, you've got to have some kind of vision um, of where things are going. Now, you, some of you might be thinking, hold on, that's the boss's job, I'm not the boss. Um, but that's not entirely true because 
every one of us comes into contact with other people. And at the moment, um, I'll give you an example, having a, a conversation with colleagues and friends who are in Melbourne, Australia, under a long lockdown again. So the first thing that they feel is that there is no vision, there's no future, there's no way out. You know, they, they extended the state of emergency for another 12 months. Uh, that gives them the, the, the opportunity to, to do things which normally you wouldn't expect in a, in a democratic society. So they're thinking, well, hold on, if this is never ending, where do we go? And what they're missing is a sense of vision. And a vision does not have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be that horrible business language. A vision can be a, a folk story that explains what you're trying to do, what you're trying to achieve. Now, if you're a leader, you need to have a vision that resonates and feels human to the people in your team. But if you don't feel you're that kind of leader, maybe, you are, maybe you're a classroom teacher um, with just groups of pupils, groups of students, um, and you think, well, how, you know, how does having a vision make a difference there? Well, it really will because students and parents and workers, everyone wants to know what's happening next. Now, no one can tell them that outside your school or outside your business or outside your organization, but inside your school and inside your organization, you can maybe offer the only opportunity in their day where you're able to give some certainty of vision and say, this is what we are going to try to create together. It doesn't mean that you manage. It doesn't mean that you will, but it says to people, this is what I would like to try to do with you. Do you want to join me? And you know, people have gone to the moon on visions less robust than that. So what can you do? How can you take your team to the moon, uh, metaphorically, uh, by giving them a vision? Now the picture you can see here for creating a vision, you'll notice that there are young people here. This is a school in Glasgow. And um, the young people here were helping to develop a vision of what they wanted their school to become. So could you involve your class? Could you involve your student council? Could you involve your workers, your co-workers? Can you involve your parents or your community in designing, in co-designing that vision together? This is the vision that that community in Glasgow created. They said, we're going to create an environment that's known for building brilliant ideas so that everyone can flourish. And they've even got four strategies to make that happen, which are underneath. So let's help each other to be brave enough to fail and tough enough to bounce back. These are, um, if you're coming up with strategy or these kinds of value statements, don't just use words like brave. Put it in a sentence that tells everyone how to behave. You're looking for behavior change. So we say, let's do this, let's do that. Let's help each other be brave. Let's uh, grow uh, our networks to make the whole school to make the whole world our school and so on. So what's your strategy? What's that vision going to look like? And keep it in human language, not business speak. The third point is you do need to innovate. I've had someone say that this is the last time uh, that they would choose to innovate. I actually think it's one of the best times you can innovate. When everything around you is broken, that's the time to start innovating. When nothing makes sense anymore, that's the opportunity to innovate. When your exam system makes no sense, that's the time to change it. So um, when you want to innovate, it's not as simple as just shaking things and breaking them. You have to have a plan. And so we use this, uh, it's stolen from McKinsey, but they're, they're big enough and ugly enough to, to, sh to steal from. And then um, what do McKinsey do? They talk about the three horizons. So three horizons are the idea that you've got three horizons of change. The first horizon is where you can see today, um, very short term, the current way of doing things. The second horizon is the journey, is the horizon that is just a little bit out of reach. And the third horizon, maybe you can't even see that horizon yet, but you know it's over there. If you sail far enough, fast enough, it's over there. So what you want is the new idea to take over and replace the old idea. And that's why you have these crossing lines. So the idea on the top at the beginning, that's the normal way of doing things with the new idea not really adopted by many people. But by the end, you want the new idea to be the new normal. So what you have to do, you have to start. You have to start with an idea. 
uh, and preferably lots of ideas because not all ideas will succeed. So the more you have, the more likely one is likely to fly. And you explore concepts as well. So although this is really hard, um, when there's maybe a sense of urgency at the moment, we've got to get things done. If you're in business, we've got to make money. If you're in school, we've got to get back to normality. Well, you don't have to do either. You, you do need to take time to explore. So explore the world around you and decide where, listen to people and decide where is the area that we need to work most. And then the next thing is prototype it, test out your idea. So when you think you've got an idea, don't then do more research, build a terrible idea into something and test it out to see if it was terrible. Build what you thought was the best idea with the least uh, amount of resource possible, prototype it, and then see whether people really want it or not, and get evidence that it will have that impact that you're looking for. Get feedback early on. So this is the part that we often struggle with. Um, people say, well, people didn't like the idea, but they must be wrong, or people didn't like the idea, we need to just change the idea. There's nothing wrong with killing an idea that's not having the impact that you thought. And the only reason you should continue with an idea is because it's offering value and impact to someone else. And if you can't show that it has value and impact, then you have to justify it to yourself. And it, for me, that's unjustifiable. Life is too short to be going around doing stuff that doesn't make an impact for other people. So is, the other thing is that when you know you're having that kind of impact, you're able to come up with a better case for building the idea even bigger. So you can say, yeah, we, we did this research, we did a test, look at the impact, now we need some money to make it scale, to, to bring it to more people. And that's the point where you can start looking at things becoming normal. That's the point where you can start connecting all your new ideas to create something really quite different and really challenge the status quo. And that journey, that her second horizon, that's the part that requires a lot of skill set. The vision is in your third horizon and the listening is all done in the first horizon. So listen in the first horizon, have a vision for that third horizon, and then you need some tools to work out how to navigate the tricky waters of feedback and people uh, giving their ideas, uh, trying to make your idea better, and um, trying to take your idea away from you so that it can survive out with other people. So communication is really the key tool to navigating that second horizon. Communication is listening as much as speaking, but it also is about how you um, communicate with a relentless positivity. Uh, part of our work has been directing election campaigns, very successful election campaigns, uh, particularly in the digital space. And what we learned is, I love Michelle Obama, um, when she says, you know, when they go low, we go high. She's talking about relentless positivity. You've got to be positive. You might be the only positive person that the young people around you see during a day when things are tough at home, uh, when things are tough in the community. So when you're communicating, it goes back again to the benefit. This is the only question you have to be able to answer about anything that you are planning to make other people do or ask other people to do. What is in it for them? What's the prize? So to help you do that, the key tool I would suggest is one from the world of advertising and copywriting. It's called FAB, for FAB stories. If you want a fabulous story that people will remember, you need to tell them what happened. That's the feature. You need to tell them why, theoretically, it's a good idea. That's the advantage. And then you need to tell them, well, what happened in the end? What was the benefit? What was the impact for people? And those are fab stories. And everything you say, if you are in a position where you have to speak to a large group of people to begin their new school year, for example, or if you're welcoming back team members, every paragraph you speak should be a fab paragraph. It should always have impact at the heart of it. And if it doesn't have impact, why on earth are you wasting our time by saying this? If you have no evidence that what you're proposing is going to make a meaningful impact, then why are you saying it? A good example of a simple 
paragraph that I would say if I was the leading a team, especially at the beginning of a school year, is simply this, a team of teachers. I would say there's one thing I'm going to ask you to do and worry about, only one thing, and it's that you smile to every learner on that first day in particular, and that you ask them twice how things are going. And if all you do is talk about how people feel, I'll be happy. Why? Because the impact of them feeling comfortable on their learning is going to be greater than the impact of you trying to teach people who are not ready to learn. There you go. That's a fab story. It's a way of, of bringing your team together and helping them understand what they need to do, but without you having to kind of tell them. You make it so obvious that they want to do it. And as you and your team develop ideas, that's one idea, you know, that is one idea that I've just shared with you, that we're not going to worry about learning for the first week. We're just going to worry about how people are and making sure people are ready for learning, making sure that they've got their life ready for it and that they're primed. But um, that's one idea. You would want to come up with lots of ideas and then decide. So decide based on impact. You can use tools like this. This is one of my favorite, it's another two by two. Two by twos are simply where you have your four boxes, two lines in the middle. So you can look at what are the needs of our people, our customers, our students, our staff, or you could look at what's going to have an impact, or you could say, we've listened to people for a month and they have a desire for X, Y, or Z. And then you just do it based on price. Do you have a lot of money or do you not have a lot of money? Can you get a lot of money or can you not get any money? Um, what about time? Does it need a low amount of time or is it going to take people a long time? On the question of time, time is, an, is the most important investment people can give. What we've noticed over the last seven months or so uh, since our first schools in Hong Kong and China began to be affected by the, the, the challenges that we're all facing is that everything, all projects seem to take about twice as long and people are notoriously poor estimating how long things will take. So for this idea of investment of time, add more time. <laughs> uh, assume that it's going to take double. So then when you color code these, there's a really nice green sweet spot. There are two amber spots that you have to be careful about. And there is a very dangerous red area that you don't want to be stuck in. We say that things that have a high need or are going to have a high impact, or which have a high desire, and which have a low investment, do them as soon as possible. They're great. But obviously, if there's a low desire to do something and it's expensive, why on earth would you do it there? If it's high investment, it costs a lot of time or money, but it does have a high impact, do it later. And this area is a little bit risky. If it's a low investment, it seems like it's a low investment of time, but the impact might not be very high. I call that the busy work zone. It's where people get very busy, but don't seem to really make much impact. And you don't want to be there either. So that can become, in these moments, that can become a place where you waste a lot of time. And then the final thing is test your ideas. Um, when we test our ideas, we test them theoretically first, and then we test them for real. So this is a metaphor that uses rocks on the one hand. It's a boat and sailing metaphor. So the, the people from Gdansk will understand this and everyone else will be completely lost. But um, if you have a rock as a sailor, um, rocks are not a bad thing. They represent stability. They are constants. They're always there. So you actually use rocks as a navigation device. So you have rock values in your organization. These are things that will never change. You also have ideas and innovations and creative development and things happening, which are whirlpools. You know, water that spins incredibly exciting, but also quite risky. You stand to potentially lose things. And when these two ideas come together, you have conflict. So the problem is you have to think through what is the conflict that will arise from this new idea? And if that conflict were to arise, what would a compromise be with which I would not be happy. So for example, essential values uh, that uh, our organization have are that we are provocative and supportive. 
On the Whirlpool side, we're looking at how we do this online. So you have a conflict here in the online, you lose some of the context that makes your prov provocation in a face-to-face -face environment easy. Online provocation can just be annoying for people. So that's the conflict. It's just annoying. It's too much. So the failing compromise for us is that we try to soften what we do and it becomes a bit vanilla and it becomes a bit like everything else that you've got. And so we're not useful, we're not supportive, but we're not even interesting. So what we then have to try and do is find something that takes the best of both worlds and puts it out. In our case, we said that we are um, yeah, provocative, but supportive, but we want to be able to offer this online. And so actually webinars like this, we're gonna do less of them, but we're gonna do more long form coaching where we work over a longer period of time with people and we have a relationship with a relationship, you can have more smiles, more laughs. We can understand that a provocation is there to be helpful. And we also have the time to be supportive. And so we're not going to do, uh, you know, people get in touch and they say, could you do a one hour talk with my school? And we're saying no, because it's going to have no impact. It's not going to have the impact that we want, but long term it can if we do this. There you go. And that's the order you approach that in, those rocks and whirlpools. And um, what you've got then are predictable challenges that you can see through. You've got negative results that you do not want to see happen. And that means that when people suggest a course of action and you say, no, 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 we're not going to do that. And we've thought through why. Instead, we're going to do this. And you have your idea ready. You have your second idea ready to make sure that you succeed. And of course, the final thing is you've got to act. You've got to do something uh, with what you've discovered. Now, most people at the moment are heading back into teams and not everyone is going to be as committed to the kind of changes that need to happen. None of us asked for what's going on at the moment. So a lot of people are maybe finding that they're in a job and they're saying, you know what, I didn't sign up for this. I didn't sign up for online teaching or blended learning. I, sign I didn't sign up for um, trying to learn at home with my son coming in in the background and and listening to what's going on. I didn't sign up for that, I can't do that. And so what you have is you can have high commitment, but you will also have low commitment, not because people are bad, but because the circumstances changed and they didn't want that. So what do you do with that level of commitment? And then what do you do when people are skilled or not skilled in something? So if someone is highly committed and they have high competence, Turn them into your coaches and mentors. Give them a promotion. Give them that job. Free up some time so that they can lead a group and they can be uh, the coach. You can also delegate projects to them. You can say, we need this impact. I don't know how. Off you go. And they'll get on with it. They're highly skilled, highly committed. You've also got high commitment, low competence. So these are people who don't know how, but they have high commitment. So they need to learn how to do the thing, but they will learn given some time. So maybe they just need more time or maybe they need a mentor or a coach. So can you draw a list of the people in your team and in your organization, the people around you? Can you do a list of the students in your class and work out who is green, who is amber, and what role am I going to give them when they come back to class next week or when we come back to school? What do you do with people who have variable commitment? So they have low commitment and some competence. Well, actually, they're trainable. They're still trainable, but you've got to have a conversation with them about the blocker. What's the psychological block? Why is your commitment low? So we're going back to listening again, try and understand what the block is. And then your job as a leader is just to try and remove that barrier to free them up to go and do it. The last group, very bold commitment and highly skilled. They're the hardest to deal with. We call them genius jerks. They're really smart at what they do, but they're a pain to work with. I'm sure you have them in every class, you have them in every team. If you can fire them, that's the most expedient way, but it's maybe not the easiest and it's maybe not the best way to get around the challenge. What we find is you've got to share your vision with them and much like the green people, share your vision and let them go and run a project and have success with it. But don't micromanage, don't try and change them to, to work like you. So, I've shared uh, with you a whole bunch of tools um, to try and be as, as practical as possible. Um, I've shared some ideas about how you might communicate 
with your teams next week when you get back. Um, and I've also hopefully shared some of the key steps that you can undertake together uh, with your team, even in those days back, to learn together and to take time to listen, to co-design a vision of what you want to try and achieve between now and December. What, what's the best thing you think you can create in that time? Um, some tools to structure your discussion, some tools to think about your team. So at that point, uh, I, I don't know if you, I, I don't think you've posted any questions yet in the chat, but you may have some questions that you want to ask now. And if you want to do that, you'll notice that in Zoom, if you click the uh, chat button, um, there is a, um, a little yes sign. And if I can do it there, you'll see there's a, a green uh, uh, tick appears next to my name. And if you have a question that you want to ask, you can do your green tick or you can just write your question in the chat and Ava will pick up on that. But are there any questions straight away? And Ava, maybe you have a, a question to get us started. First of all, thank you for sharing all those uh, insights, thoughts and uh, tools actually. And uh, what really uh, like moved me was that um, uh, in, your, in the first part of your uh, speech, you talked about, um, well, I, I interpreted it uh, as common language because you talked about different uh, types of communication, five, uh, five different types. And what I was thinking was, oh my God, it is so important to, to, you know, to establish common language so that we can communicate much more easily. Because um, even um, in the last, uh, in March, actually, we started um, doing research among Polish teachers uh, and students and Polish parents uh, as well. And what we saw in the, in the data was that, um, there's really um, like great, huge need for uh, better communication. And uh, uh, that we are still uh, very often think through stere stereotypes. And uh, um, yeah, we, we could really um, see more human, more people in others. It would be much more uh, convenient for us. And what I was uh, thinking, um, um, is how could we uh, apply it to communication with not only with our staff at school, but with uh, parents who also struggle a lot with you know online um, education, who from uh, you know from day to day they were uh, given <laughs> the pleasure to teach their children. How? Uh, is it possible or how could we as uh, teachers or as superintendents um, make it easier also for the parents to, um, to land in this new reality? That, that, will, that is my question in my mind. I think that for parents, I think for teachers, it feels very complicated and complex. And for parents, it feels the same. It feels like a bit of a mess. Um, even going back to school this year here, um, the, the amount of communication from um, my daughter's own school has been quite significant and there's no shared language. It's a lot of jargon. It's a lot of repetition of the government's jargon as well. And I don't think that's helpful because it becomes um, meaningless. So instead, um, I, my plea is that people write in the same way as they speak in the same way as they speak to their family. I, I, I understand that culturally and linguistically, things are different in Poland um, and things are different in France, for example, or in Germany. The way that we write in organizations is very different to the way that we would speak in a cafe. But at this time, people need human language. They don't need your organizational language. They need a, a, a human language. That is your shared language because everyone understands it. No one understands organizational jargon, but everyone understands the language you talk when you go to the restaurant or the cafe, when you speak in plain Polish. So what is plain Polish? You'd say plain English. What's the simplest way? And generally, it's how you speak. So I'll show you an example from um, it's an independent school in Poland, from the American School of Warsaw. 
uh, but we worked with them on some of that shared language. This is their mission and value statement on their website. Look at the core values. It's really simple English. Make the whole world your classroom, step forward and make things happen. Don't wait. Work together because without us all, we're nothing. Bounce back when things don't go your way and put the same into life as you put into school. Now, if you're a parent, you understand what that means. And you can understand what it means if English is your third language. The mission statement, you know, we're determined to be a community that changes the world for the better. Here, it's all about what you can do rather than what you can't. I don't have to read much further. You understand what we're saying because it's written in plain English. And a good test is, does it translate? So the first thing we did, the first thing we did was translate that into Polish. And when we translated it into Polish, we had to change some of the English. Translate it into French or Spanish, any languages you speak. If you can translate it, then it's probably simple enough. If you can't translate it, you've written nonsense. You've written jargon, go back and do it again. So your shared language, rather than having to do a big community exercise like we did in Warsaw, maybe what you want to do is simply revert to the language that people use every day. And uh, it's not patronizing. It's not um, a loss of face. This is about being clearly understood. Yeah, that's very useful advice. Thank you very much. And what I am thinking, uh, I'm thinking about uh, one more issue, one more question, if it's okay for you. Yeah, absolutely. Go for it. Uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, I I am thinking about uh, direct school directors um, or the board of directors uh, at schools who like feel the duty to know the answers. You know that they feel that they are the leaders and it's their obligation to uh, set the maybe the vision, maybe just goals, maybe you know just just that they have everything on their backs. What would be your advice if someone feels that way and somehow maybe feels lonely in this uh, leadership, on this leadership mountain, let's say, uh, mm. what would be your first advice, uh, first step to take on uh, into this co-creation um, road? How, what, what, where to start actually? Um, I think it's it's quite easy, and I'm going to I'm going to go for a quote from uh, someone who in inspired me, but also who um, you know I think has inspired most educators I, I would think over the past decade, and it's Sir Ken Robinson. And you may have seen over the weekend, um, and sadly Sir, uh, Sir Ken died on uh, Friday after a short battle with cancer. He had this um, uh, beautiful uh, way of explaining very complex things in a very simple way. And you would find people, when they were listening to him uh, give, a, give a talk, you'd find people laughing. People think that they were laughing because he was a, he's funny, he's very entertaining. But he wasn't actually cracking jokes he was making us laugh at ourselves because we make things so complicated. We make things, you know, so we think that making things sound complicated makes us look clever. This is a time when people need to say things that are very simple and worry less about themselves looking clever. So I also think we've seen, I'm not going to speak about Polish politicians because I don't know anything about them, but I have seen politicians in England get things so wrong so frequently that I think the idea that um, somehow leaders have all the answers. That's been thoroughly debunked over the past six months. We've seen that our leaders are often incompetent, um, often no less than the person down the road from us, um, and trying to do anything, uh, trying to come over as anything other than normal, as one, like one of the other people, um, doesn't go very well. What did Sir Ken say? He said this. He said, if you're not prepared to be wrong, you'll never come up with anything original. And I think that's the challenge. Maybe not the originality, but I think that what we do need at the moment is some ingenuity. We need leaders who are prepared to come up with alternative ideas to the way things have been, not just sticking with the way things always have been. So the first thing any leader should realize is that they're in their position today because of what they did in an era which no longer works. 
So the first thing is they're all in their jobs because they were good at doing stuff that they can no longer do. No one can do it that way anymore. So they need to have some humility and understanding that perhaps, yeah, they don't have all the answers. And in their community, there will be answers. And their final point is that um, we, our own team at Notosh, we believe that you are far more likely uh, to uh, come up with the best possible ideas when you co-design them. They may not be your idea, but they will be the best idea in terms of the impact they have for people. Um, no one is smarter than the room. And so you've got to find mechanisms to be able to tap into that. Now, culturally, there are cultures where that's harder than others. And I think that co-design, from my experience, the co-design is harder in communities with traditionally there's been this hierarchical approach to doing things. And Poland is one of those countries where I have definitely seen it's harder to create that co-design because with a certain generation or a certain uh, type of, of, of uh, approach, it's been more hierarchical in the past. And people expect to be told or expect um, a leader to come in and kill their idea um, because it's not theirs or they didn't follow a particular process. I would encourage everyone to try and break that stereotype. Um, I think it's a stereotype. I don't think it's the reality of every day. And the most ingenious, most fun people that I've worked with uh, in Poland have been the rule breakers who've come up with the ideas that break what used to be there and replace it with something that's joyous and just so much better than the status quo. So if you're a leader at the moment and you're feeling lost, it's worth you can lead by telling people that, you know what, none of us know what's coming around the corner. And if ever there was a time I needed the team, it's now. And I hope that, the, that you as a team come together to co-design the future with, us, with me and don't expect um, a leadership team to provide all the direction. Because we've seen over the last eight months, we can't. No one can provide that direction. We all have to provide that direction. I don't know if that's clear, but I think the idea that you, you, you can't know everything and no one expects you to, so don't try. Mm -hmm. I saw we have question on chat. You it's are... always the way when we're towards the end of an hour, but I'm happy to take a final question from the floor. It's a really good question as well. And if you're sat there with um, you know, a blank sheet of paper and you're thinking, especially if, I don't know if, you're, if you have to stand in front of a team soon and uh, kind of say, hey guys, this is, this is the vision, this is where we're going. Um, I wouldn't do that. I think that's a really, um, I think that the best thing you can do is actually start not by declaring a vision, but start by listening to what people feel. Um, and write down everything they tell you. That will create a vision. When people tell you how they feel, they'll say, I feel that school is the only place where everyone knows me. I feel school is the place where, I, where I'm comfortable. School is the place I get quiet. Because remember, we've just had eight months of no one having quiet to learn or to do their work. So school is the place I go and feel comfortable. School is the place I know someone cares for me. There's a vision. We've just written one together. Those are the words that a lot of young people have said uh, to my team over the past two or three weeks. Those are verbatim what young people have said. So why not just bring, if, I don't know if you're in a school, but bring young people, bring the teachers together in the same room and go and ask them, what do you feel at the moment and what does school mean for you? And I think that would give you everything you need to write your vision. So I would, abs I would keep the blank paper and I'd go for a walk today instead of trying to write your vision. Um, go for a walk and get healthy and get ready for all that listening that you're going to do. And if you are part of a team of leaders, you should all be out listening. You should be in classrooms. I would say for the first month, your only job is to walk into classrooms and have conversations with kids and teachers and create relationships and listen to what they have to say because they'll thank you for that. They will not thank you for standing up and saying everything's going to be all right, because it's not. We can't say everything to be right. We can't give false promises. We have to, yeah, I think listening is the best. Are there any final questions or shall we, shall we wrap it up there? And of course, if you want to ask questions, it's always the way that you have a good question just at the point where 
it's time you know you're driving home or you're you're on your way um, away. So there's a couple of ways you can get in touch. Uh, you can drop an email. You can go to our website, of course, and, and use a contact form there. But you can drop an email to me directly if you like. And uh, we've not launched them yet, but if you want to be first in line for our course, we have a course on transition design coming up um, with step-by-step um, -step kind of holding people's hands through this journey of listening, making sense of it, developing a fresh vision, developing a plan. If you're interested, you can um, get yourself in the, in the waiting list uh, for when we, when we start that. And it would be a pleasure to, to have representation from some of you guys. I hope today has been useful. And if you're watching this on the, the, the replay afterwards, I hope that um, you're able to use parts of it directly with your team even, or even with students and young people or with parts of your community. Um, the most important thing, if you do have some impact, if you do have some success, tell people about it. Tell me, it's always nice to know, but tell the rest of your community, tell Ava so she can uh, share that in, in newsletters and on the blog, because I think that um, the one thing I've seen over the past six or seven months is the need for people to have colleagues they can share this journey with. You can't do it alone. We have to do it with each other. So just keep sharing what you're doing, even if you, you think it's a small thing that you did, because that small thing could be incredibly important to your neighbor. Wow, Johan, that was uh, really uh, answering your last question was so powerful that I uh, literally got the goosebumps. Is that the right word in English? Absolutely. So, yeah, so really uh, I find it very uh, like crucial to build relationships, to work on a trust and communication and, you know, let the uh, knowledge uh, channeling uh, Let's just leave it for later when we are all ready, not only children, yeah? Uh, okay, thank you, Yuan, very, very much. Uh, it was an honor to have you here. Um, and um, organizational things at the end. Uh, I know some of you probably would like to receive a certificate. And if you would like to get one, you can order... Uh, one on a web page, just uh, mm, put your name and email address, we will send a digital version. Uh, it comes with a small uh, administrative fee uh, for, you know, just uh, doing the doing the work, but I hope it's not, uh, it will not uh, stop you. So uh, for uh, at the end, just let me say that I really, really hope that we can meet during uh, next webinars or maybe in some different um, areas or places maybe even you know like live <laughs> on site and take another steps on on this our um, our road to design solutions design better solutions for education together and thank you very much for participation and hope to see you Hope to meet you soon. Thank you, Eva. Bye-bye, everyone.